Um, hello, greetings. Um, thank you for uh, for the wonderful uh, invitation and uh, and the opportunity to um, to teach and to uh, to give some lectures um, on anterior approach hip replacement uh, for master class, which um, I think is a fantastic um, uh, you know venue and a resource that um, that will be invaluable um, to uh, to surgeons. Um, my name is Jonathan Eurasimides. Now I'm currently in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, in the United States. Um, I am a specialist um, in hip arthroplasty, uh, specifically um, anterior approach hip arthroplasty. Uh, I've been performing anterior approach hip arthroplasty uh, since 2006 um, here in the, in the U.S. Um, it's my entire practice, um, primary and revision hip arthroplasty, um, all through the anterior approach, um, or at least 99% through the anterior approach. Um, in my almost 16 years here, uh, I've performed over 10,000 uh, primary and revision hip replacement procedures um, through the anterior approach. Um, so I've been asked to uh, provide five lectures um, in this series, uh, specifically dedicated to this technique uh, for hip replacement. Uh, in this first lecture, um, it's going to be an introduction uh, to the procedure, um, everything from the origins of the approach to the hip, um, the history of the procedure, um, indications and preoperative considerations, and then a brief overview of the technical steps of the surgery. Um, lecture two is going to focus on the surgery itself and the primary um, uh, hip replacement through an anterior approach, um, where we'll review things such as setup, instruments, um, there'll be a video um, associated with it as well. I know my myself, I particularly learn better with videos. Um, lecture three is going to go on to more uh, advanced techniques um, regarding the way I interpret um, intraoperative uh, fluoroscopy, uh, extension of the uh, primary incision down the femur to gain access, extension of the incision proximally to gain access to the acetabulum. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the bikini incision, which is uh, becoming a little more popular uh, nowadays, especially in morbidly obese or patients with uh, deep hip creases. Uh, lecture four is going to be um, dedicated to acetabular revision. So we'll talk about understanding the defect, um, being able to look at a two-dimensional AP pelvis and understand what the defect is primarily from that um, before going on to additional testing. Uh, using simple things like jumbo cups all the way out to augments. And again, I'll have a video um, showing a revision uh, acetabular component. The fifth and final lecture will be dedicated to femoral revision. Uh, the femur has always been the, um, uh, the more difficult part of this uh, procedure for most. Uh, and this will be on how to revise the femur. Um, things from periprosthetic hip fractures to removal of well-fixed uh, femoral components um, to osteotomies of the femur and what osteotomies we use um, from an anterior approach. And again, I'll have a video um, associated with that as well. Um, so that's just something about me and I'm going to get on with, uh, with the lecture and, uh, and hopefully share some of my knowledge and uh, my experiences um, with you, um, so that you can, you know, hopefully gain an appreciation and, uh, decrease the, uh, the learning curve in this procedure. Um, so again, this is the introduction, um, to anterior approach. We're going to go over all the, the very small things at the beginning, not going to be a whole lot about the surgery itself, but more about how to select and, and where this thing came from. So this, this surgery is, is actually quite old, or this approach to the hips quite old. Um, the first surgeon ever to publish an article about this surgery uh, was a German surgeon named uh, Karl Hüter. Uh, he published an article in 1881 
describing a approach to the hip joint uh, through an internervous intramuscular plane. So this is the first time we see this, this approach being described anywhere in the literature. Now, later here in the, uh, in the US, we had a, a surgeon named Marius Smith Peterson, um, who was in Boston, and he described um, the first English speaking literature on this approach. Um, primarily at that time in the early 1900s, he was using it for um, DDH uh, surgery. Uh, but then later in the 1940s, um, he was also describing using this technique uh, for a mold arthroplasty of the hip. And this is probably the first uh, description we have of an arthroplasty procedure being performed from an anterior approach. Now, granted, this is the 1940s and, and certainly significantly before, you know, the posterior approach, which uh, didn't arise until the late 70s, which was once called the Southern approach. Um, so anterior approach actually predates, uh, you know, our posterior approach um, as far as an arthroplasty procedure goes. Um, and then later on in France in uh, 1950, um, Robert and Jean Judet um, described using this particular approach um, for an acrylic head uh, replacement, which again was an arthroplasty procedure. Um, but this is kind of where we look at here in the U.S. We look at this at this approach um, originating from the Judais um, because they were using a fracture table, um, which is similar to what we use here in the U.S. Uh, for the most part. Um, but this is kind of the, the birthplace when you're looking at what we look at the surgery is how we're doing it right now. Um, Joel Matta, who is my mentor, um, that's who I trained with. I spent one year fellowship with him. Um, he originally learned this in France. Um, he had gone to France in, uh, in the early 1980s um, to be trained under world-renowned pelvis and acetabular fracture surgeon, uh, Emile Letournel. And um, Letournel and Judet um, were partners and, you know, of course, famous for the, you know, the classification of acetabular systems or acetabular fractures um, and, uh, and the Jude fracture table. Um, but really is strange because it wasn't until about 15 years later after Dr. Mata had become world renowned for fractures of the pelvis and acetabulum um, that a patient had approached him in Los Angeles and asked him to perform an anterior approach hip replacement. Uh, this particular patient uh, had had the opposite side done in France and had looked up and found Dr. Mata and discovered that he trained in France in this same clinic where his hip was replaced. And he asked him, can you do the same thing? And that uh, kind of re-sparked Dr. Mata's interest in this surgery that he had witnessed in France, uh, but really not paid too much attention to. And so that was the, the first time he had performed one. And he's kind of looked at as, as developing our modern version of this historical um, you know, surgical technique. And I was fortunate enough to spend a year with him uh, from 2005 until 2006. Um, the original rationale, uh, at least, you know, as, as told to me by, uh, by Dr. Mata from, you know, the, the surgeons in France, you know, Jude and Letournel, was the original rationale for this, this approach was that the patient was in a supine position. So in a supine position, it's easier to appreciate the positioning of the acetabular component because the patient's flat. Uh, there's not a variability in being lateral and being tilted five or 10 degrees one way or the other. Um, the other reason was the supine position allowed for easier access of leg length. Um, you know, when you're on your side and one leg is straight and one leg is adducted, um, uh, the legs aren't, aren't similar lengths, um, even though they might be exactly the same length. 
whenever a person's flat on their back with their legs straight forward, it's easier to, to appreciate the, the leg length. Um, the hip is also an anterior structure. So the hip is much closer to the front of your body than it is the back of your body. Um, uh, this is normal for any flexion crease of our body. If you think about flexion creases, whether it's the hip flexion crease, the back of the knee, the front of the elbow, anywhere where a joint has to bend, there's not going to be a large collection of muscle or fat because the joint has to be able to bend. And so the hip flexor, you know, surface of the, um, of the pelvis um, does not carry a lot of fat and um, nor does it carry a, a very thick muscle um, envelope, uh, the opposite of the posterior part of the joint. So the hip is closer to the front of the body. Um, it's an inner nervous, intermuscular plane. Um, and the supine position was, uh, was easy to assess the acetabular component as well as the leg length. Um, other advantages of this approach, if you want to compare it to, say, a posterior approach, you know, the posterior capsule is intact, um, which to us equals no dislocation precautions. Um, it's not to say an anterior approach hip cannot dislocate um, because they still can have anterior instability. But if you think about how we spend most of our lives, um, we don't spend a lot of our life with our leg extended and externally rotated, which would be the position of dislocation for an anterior approach. Um, we spend a significant amount of our life in a seated position or hip flexion or reaching down to put on a sock or a shoe or pants. And so that makes posterior approach more naturally um, susceptible to dislocation, uh, not to mention the position of the components is a much more difficult scenario uh, with a posterior approach compared to the anterior approach. Uh, another advantage is that the abductors are left intact. Um, the anterolateral approach, which is also a very stable surgical approach to the hip, has the disadvantage of releasing the abductors and reattaching them and requiring them to heal back, which can lead to a prolonged limp. And so the anterior approach avoids the posterior capsule. It avoids the abductors, um, which make it a stable joint that has a very quick time to recovery. Um, this video here that I'm going to show is a patient of mine from just within the last six months, um, about two hours um, post hip replacement. Now, this is a big, big fellow. His body mass index was somewhere around 45 or 46. And this is him about two hours post-surgery. Um, so uh, the recovery is extremely fast um, with an anterior approach uh, hip replacement. Um, it also does other things, the potential for bilateral hips, uh, which uh, I, I used to perform quite a bit, um, performing them less and less as time goes on. Uh, but the supine position allows easy access for, for bilateral hip replacement. Uh, I'm a big fan of the use of fluoroscopy in the operating room. I feel like in the supine position, it's so easy to have fluoroscopy and to take good pictures um, that uh, there's no reason not to use it because it just adds so much value when it comes to the position of the acetabular component, um, the position and fill of the femoral component, um, the leg length and the offset. So I just feel like, um, you know, if it's easily available, then, uh, then I should use it. And I'm a big proponent of fluoroscopy in the operating room. Um, <clears throat> the preservation of the hip deltoid. Now, you would uh, commonly, the hip deltoid is known as being the gluteus medius, okay? So the gluteus medius is, is commonly known as the deltoid of the hip. Um, my my belief is that the medius is probably more akin uh, to the rotator cuff of the hip. Um, we're using the term hip deltoid, trying to compare it to the shoulder, but I believe the medius is more of the rotator cuff and the deltoid is the confluence of the gluteus maximus and the tensor fasciae lata, um, similar to in a shoulder. 
Um, both of these things are preserved with an anterior approach, um, which again, provides stability of the joint, but it also provides earlier walking without a limp, uh, better pelvic stability, um, and you know, quicker regaining function without use of an assisted device. Um, there's been some studies done uh, recently, um, just comparing anterior approach to other approaches. This one was done on muscle damage. It's a very, very simple study uh, that was in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, where they looked at, um, at you know, muscle damage markers. So creatinine kinase, C-reactive protein, interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, and they checked him in the PACU, post-op day one, post-op day two. Um, the the um, chart that you see down on your right just shows uh, kind of the um, uh, overall um, results um, and where immediately after surgery, posterior approach obviously showed much more muscle damage. Post-op day one, both spike up. Posterior approach still has more muscle damage. Post-op day two, uh, in direct anterior, the inflammatory markers dramatically decreased, decreased um, and the posterior approach continued to elevate. Now, I wish this study may have gone out and checked him farther on down the road instead of just two days after surgery, but nonetheless, it, it was something that was very easy to do and showed an objective measure of, yes, there's less muscle damage from the actual surgery um, you know, then compared to a posterior approach, um, using fluoroscopy. I'm a big proponent of fluoroscopy. Um, this paper compared, um, posterior approach, uh, with anterior approach. Now the posterior approach patients obviously did not use fluoroscopy. Um, the anterior approach patients had the use of fluoroscopy. Um, so you can, you can just imagine that the, the results are going to be better for direct anterior, and they were, you know, target inclination was hit 98% of the anterior versus 86 of the posterior, target antiversion 97 versus 77. Um, I think this is what's pushed the desire for things like navigation, um, things like computer assisted um, or um, surgery or the robots. Um, because posterior approach is very difficult to, to assess a component position because you don't always know what your, the space, what your pelvis is, where it is in space. You know, you have a lateral position, but it's very easy to be tilted a little bit one way, a little bit the other way. So it just makes natural sense. And, and again, I'm a big proponent of fluoroscopy. So, you know, I'm a wholehearted believer in it. Um, this was a, a meta-analysis um, in Journal of Arthroplasty that was just looking at, at all the studies it could, comparing direct anterior and posterior. Um, and essentially what it showed, the, the basic gist of it was that hospitalization was shorter with direct anterior, dislocations were shorter. Um, there were nine of the 17 studies that, that looked at short-term pain and functional outcomes. Five showed no difference, four favored direct anterior. So nah, it may not be statistically significant, but I think that, that uh, those of us that have done anterior approach and that have also done posterior approach uh, recognize that patients do recover um, better, especially in the early postoperative period. Um, trying to pick out the right patient when you're very first starting. These are things that are somewhat, they somewhat make sense. I mean, these aren't, you know, revelations or, or uh, something that wouldn't make sense with any approach, frankly. Um, you know, thin patient, um, female, why do we say female? Because uh, females tend to have less muscle mass. And because, you know, increased muscle mass makes any surgery more difficult, no matter if you're talking about a hip surgery or a knee surgery or shoulder surgery. So thin, female, um, no deformities, no previous surgeries, obviously, bone quality being good. We're going to speak about uh, femoral complications and the problems with accessing the femur. And so you don't want to set yourself up to have a bad outcome by going after an osteoporotic person as one of your first cases. 
um, because it's just setting yourself up for potential problems um, if you don't have to. Um, in regards to obesity, we talked about the hip being closer to the front of the body uh, than the back of the body. So the, in an obese patient, certainly the hip is still closer to the front of the body, but it's also deeper compared to the, to the level of the skin versus someone skinny. Um, so in turn, when you're trying to elevate the femur to prepare the femur in someone who's obese, who you have more tissue to get down through, uh, the femoral elevation is going to be a lot more difficult. Um, crossing these heavy skin creases like the one I have in this arrow, that's probably the biggest disadvantage of an anterior approach uh, with regards to obesity. Because when we cross heavy creases um, in the hip flexion crease uh, with an incision, these areas are extremely high risk for wound dehiscence because it's a high stress area. Um, this is where I'll bring in something like a bikini incision, which we're going to discuss in the uh, in the next lecture in the series, um, or I guess lecture three in the series, sorry. Um, but this is a situation where I might change my incision uh, based on a heavy skin crease. Um, even though the hip is deeper, obviously, than someone who's skinny, that we do have skin creases to consider, I still think that replacing a hip in an obese person from an anterior approach is easier than going from through a posterior approach. Uh, posterior approach is a much deeper wound. Positioning of the acetabular component is extremely difficult. Um, and so I think that for those reasons, um, I think that technically anterior approach is superior for an obese patient. Um, we spoke about the heavily muscled patient earlier. Um, these are the hardest patients, period. Um, muscle is much harder to attract than fat. And so a heavily muscled person, uh, you know, your young male athletic, that's going to be your most difficult case. And that's going to be one that you know, uh, you might, um, you might try to avoid when you're first starting out and you want to get the easiest chip shot case possible. When I'm, when we're looking at x-rays preoperatively, um, there's some, some things on the x-ray that can tip you off to, will this case be easier or will this case be harder? Um, the simplest when you're looking at the pelvis is the width of the pelvis. So uh, this is a common thing we talk about, this plumb line where a line drawn through the, the diaphysis of the femur and carried straight up. Where does it cross the iliac crest, okay? This, this patient um, whose picture x-ray is on the left, you know, that plumb line goes lateral to the iliac crest, all the way over to the far right, where the iliac crest overhangs that plumb line quite a bit. Now, why is this a problem? You know, why, what's the width of the pelvis have to do with why the surgery is going to be hard? And it's because from an anterior approach, we have to clear the iliac crest in order to broach the femur. When you're doing a posterior approach, the iliac crest is completely out of the picture and you don't have to worry about it with access to the femur. Um, so there's nothing to get in the way. But from an anterior approach, we have to get this femur lateral and elevated so we can clear the iliac crest. Now, the double offset brooch handles, like you see the one in this picture on the right, can help avoid that iliac crest. And that's why they were developed. Um, as you can see there, if you drew a straight line up the diaphysis, you might be hitting the iliac crest or very close to it whereas this dual offset handle, you know, clears you. Um, I don't particularly use dual offset handles. I don't like them very much. I just don't like the feel of them, uh, but they do make life a lot easier for trying to get away from that iliac crest when broaching the femur. On the femoral side, what are some things we can look at in a preoperative standpoint to say, hey, this case is gonna be easy or no, this case is gonna be difficult. Um, so the longer the femoral neck, uh, 
and the more valgus the femoral neck, the easier the surgery. The more varus and the more short the femoral neck, the more difficult it's going to be. And it has to do with the length of the hip capsule. So when we're trying to elevate the femur, we've got to do two things. One, we have to get the femur lateral and away from the acetabulum. So this picture on the left shows the typical position of a femur the very first time you externally rotate it and try to drop the leg or adduct the leg. The tip of the trochanter gets caught behind the acetabulum. Now, the shorter the femoral neck, the tighter that hip capsule, and the more difficult it is to get the femur lateralized so that you can get it up around the acetabulum. The longer the neck, the more translation you have of the femur to lateralize it so that then you can elevate it up. So long necks equal long capsule equal good femoral mobility and easier access. Short varus necks equal very tight short capsules and equal very difficult access to the femur. So who are the high risk people that, that again, you may want to avoid um, you know, when you're first starting with this, uh, with this procedure, although I would say once you're comfortable with the surgery and once you've got a lot of experience with it, these are the patients that benefit from anterior approach the most, because these are the very high risk for things like instability. We're looking at patients with neuromuscular disease or cognitive impairment, like, uh, the dementia patient, um, People with very small cups, meaning you can put a, you have to use a small femoral head, uh, hip dysplasia, obesity, um, femoral neck fractures. It's one of the, the, the best surgeries you can do for someone with a femoral neck fracture. This is a person that is, you know, obviously unstable uh, on their feet. They may be cognitively impaired. Um, and they have the highest risk of dislocation after surgery. Now, conversely, the femoral neck fracture patient usually is older with poor bone quality. So you kind of have to weigh that back and forth of, you know, do I want the risk of dislocation from a posterior approach? Or do I want a stable hip that, you know, depending on my bone quality, I may have troubles with. Uh, lumbar spine disease is something that we're talking about an awful lot now. The relationship of the pelvis to the spine and why the pelvis changes when the spine changes. And so uh, here's just a, a kind of a very brief summary about what the position of the pelvis looks like based on someone's spine. So we see in this gentleman on the left standing, um, the normal straight good posture. We see when he gets increased or hyperlordosis, how the pelvic tilts forward. And that's what the picture on the x-ray on the top looks like. That would look like your inlet view of your pelvis, where the obturator foramen are very skinny and it almost looks like an inlet as the pelvis tilts forward, more of an inlet view. When somebody loses the lordosis of their lumbar spine, for instance, when they have bad lumbar arthritis, or if they've had uh, lumbar surgery with multi-level fusions, their back gets flat and the pelvis posteriorly tilts. When a pelvis posteriorly tilts, it's gonna have the appearance of the X-ray at the bottom where you have an outlet view. And look at, this is the same um, person with the inlet and outlet views and look at the position of the cup, how it looks different. So on the top X-ray, the cup looks very flat with little to no antiversion. The bottom X-ray, it looks like it has more antiversion because as the pelvis tilts back, the antiversion increases. This is true of an artificial joint. It's also true of the person's native joint. So anterior pelvic tilt, posterior pelvic tilt. What does it look like on an x-ray and what does this mean to us? Why do we care about this? Well, on the left, 
is what a normal flexible spine does from standing to sitting. When the person sits, the pelvis posteriorly tilts so that the femoral neck can clear the anterior acetabulum. But when somebody has a stiff spine, like the pictures on the right, you can see the pelvis doesn't change position, standing to sitting. This causes anterior impingement of the artificial hip and posterior dislocation. So this is why, especially from a posterior approach, um, it's become so critical and important to understand what's going on because from a posterior approach where you're already at risk for being posteriorly unstable, when you have this scenario um, of a posterior approach combined with a stiff spine, you're greatly increasing your risk of anterior impingement and posterior dislocation. So what does that mean for us when we're in the operating room? What do we have to do? Well, if a pelvis has a posterior pelvic tilt, so if this pelvis looks like an outlet view, that tells me that the person's native acetabulum is more antiverted. So as the pelvis tilts posteriorly, the anterior wall falls posterior, the posterior wall comes forward. Okay, so what's that mean for our cup position? So uh, these are two x-rays. Um, you know, one on the left would be my typical position for a patient with a normal pelvis. So I'm looking at that x-ray. I know from um, these computers and, and um, intraoperative, um, you know, adjuncts to fluoroscopy, I know that's right around 18 to 20 degrees of antiversion. The one on the right is closer to about 30 to 32 degrees of antiversion. Now, the picture on the right is what we need to do whenever somebody has a posterior pelvic tilt. Now, why do we need to do that? Well, we need to antivert them because when they sit, if they have a stiff spine, we need to prevent that anterior impingement. So they have no impingement and they won't dislocate out the back. The other thing we need to do is we need to have bony coverage of the anterior acetabulum. So if we don't anivert our cup more, then the artificial cup, the metal is gonna be overhanging the anterior acetabulum, which is going to lead to iliopsoas impingement iliopsoas tendinitis and pain. So we need to antivert the cup more to prevent psoas impingement and also to provide stability. Now, the problem for us as anterior approach surgeons is antiversion is the enemy of the anterior approach. So if you add too much antiversion, these patients can typically, they can become anteriorly unstable. Um, this would be a situation where in a severe you know, stiff spine, you know, someone with, you know, three or more levels of fusion that I'm antiverting quite a bit, I might use a dual mobility bearing uh, to help protect me against that anterior instability at the same time, preventing my impingement and providing posterior stability uh, for my cup position. So moving on to uh, just a, a brief description of the surgery itself. Um, and like I said, in the next lecture, we're really going to dig into it a little more, the actual surgery, um, along with video. Um, this lecture is just to give a basic overview and some ideas about uh, what intervals we're going through um, and where we are in the hip. And we'll get to the technical aspects of it um, in the next lecture series. Um, so the the traditional, what we would call a Smith-Peterson approach, or some people will call a Hooter approach, uh, would be the interval between tensor fascia lata and superficially sartorius, but deep is going to be the rectus, okay? The ASIS is your lighthouse. This is the most important bony landmark that you can have to both start the surgery and as you're dissecting down to assure that you're in the correct interval. We always wanna stay lateral to the ASIS. 
by staying lateral to the ASIS with both our skin and our fascia incision, we assure ourselves that our fascia incision is gonna be over the muscle belly of the tensor fascia lata, which is number two in this anatomy uh, cross section. Number one is sartorius. And if your incision, if your skin incision drips too far medial, when you open the fascia and you see the muscle belly, potentially that can be sartorius. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, well, sartorius and tensor run in two different directions. I would never confuse that. Well, the problem is they both originate off the ASIS. So the closer those two muscles get to their origin, the more parallel they are. So they're more difficult to interpret which is which. And we teach this surgery as opening the fascia, dissecting medially, and placing retractors. The problem is if you're over the muscle belly of sartorius and you dissect medially and place retractors, you're gonna be right on top of the femoral nerve. And this is where femoral nerve issues come into play. You know, femoral nerve palsies and uh, problems with the femoral nerve, I believe are due to being in the, the uh, inadequate interval. And believe me, I've seen dissection into that interval by my own residents and fellows. I've been fortunate not to have a femoral nerve palsy, but I've seen more than once coming into the operating room and looking and being like, feeling the ASIS and being like, oh guys, stop, we're, we're too far medial. So use the ASIS as your lighthouse and you'll never get into that bad situation where you're in the wrong interval and something devastating is happening. So the superficial dissection, once we go through the skin, I'm again gonna feel my ASIS under the skin before I think about making the fascia incision. The fascia over the TFL is very thin, translucent, kind of blue, but I'm looking at that and I'm not gonna open it until I feel ASIS again. So I feel the ASIS before I'm cut my skin, as soon as I get through the subcutaneous fat, I feel ASIS again, and I make my fascia incision, knowing that that muscle belly is TFL, I'm in a completely safe place, and then I'm in the right, uh, right surgical interval. Um, once I open the fascia, I'll clamp the medial side. This is a left hip, and it's a simple blunt finger dissection um, between the tensor, which is under my left finger in this extra, or in this uh, picture, and medially, you don't really see right now sartorius at all. It's superficial, and you you really don't see it. We say the intervals between tensor and sartorius, but as soon as you dive in this interval, you're already below sartorius, and now at the tip of my finger, you'll see fat blood vessels and a little blue hue, and that's the rectus. So we want to get into the interval, sweep up and down to clear the, the uh, tensor. I'll put my first retractor, which is going to be just a simple blunt cobra of some kind, over the superior neck. So the superior capsule, that's where this retractor is. So I develop a little pocket over the superior capsule um, with my finger, and I drop a retractor over that superior capsule. Then I put a self-retainer, for me, I like a Gelpie, into the interval. So we can see here on this picture, on the right, you see that retractor that's over the superior neck. On the left, you see the arms of the Gelpie. And now I'm looking for the lateral femoral circumflex vessels. These vessels are always here. 100% of the time. If you're having difficulty finding the vessels, recheck your ASIS to make sure that you're in the correct interval because they're always there and you can't cut through these vessels and not realize it, even with a bovi, because they bleed an awful lot. They look small, but they really, really bleed a lot. So you'll know if you go through them. So 
we have to identify them, we have to isolate them, and we have to ligate them. And you can do that with um, suture and tie them. Uh, you can do that with a clamp and the bovi cauterization. Um, in this picture, I'm showing the use of uh, Aquamanus, a bipolar device, um, to cauterize them. But they need to be identified, isolated, and cauterized. You'll see this fascia that's been released distal to them. So this fascia, when we're doing an extended iliofemoral approach, they call it the no-name fascia, but it's actually a, a fascia that surrounds the TFL. And by releasing this fascia as distal as you can, you're helping to mobilize the TFL um, so that it prevents it from being torn up in the case because the TFL gets a lot of retraction. And if it's not mobile, then you'll end up tearing it because without its fascial layer, it's very, very sensitive. Uh, and it'll start to tear and then kind of unravels like you're pulling yarn off of a, uh, off a sweater or off a, off a rug. So we want to cauterize the vessels, release that no-name fascia as distal as possible. Now we're going to have exposure of the anterior hip capsule. Once we go through the vessels, we'll dissect through a, a fascia layer that sits over the precapsular fat. And then through the precapsular fat, now you're onto the capsule. Um, the capsulotomy, which I perform a capsulotomy, the muscles I need to see are the vastus lateralis, which you'll see marked down on the left, and the reflected head of the rectus femoris, uh, which comes in lateral and on the, uh, on the superior hip capsule. So this would be a picture of my capsulotomy um, when I'm performing it on a left hip. Excuse me for a second. One limb of the capsulotomy follows parallel to the neck of the femur. The second limb of the capsulotomy follows along the top of the vastus. And so it's really critical when you're bringing that vertical limb of the capsulotomy down, you bring it all the way down to the top of the vastus, and then you take it across the top. If you bring that capsulotomy, if you take the transverse component of it too high, it's going to end up leading to high neck cuts, which will end up leading to difficulty getting the femoral head out, difficulty with acetabular exposure, difficulty with the release of the femur later down the road. So it's really important when you're doing a capsulotomy, if that's what you choose, that you need to bring it all the way down to the top of the vastus. Now, capsulotomy versus capsulectomy is really just a personal choice on the surgeon. Um, there's not an advantage one way or the other as far as stability. Um, there's not an advantage as far as pain, bleeding, anything of this nature. Um, it's really just a choice. I prefer keeping the capsule um, on a primary hip uh, because I just, I like the dead space being filled with native living tissue versus cutting it out and letting just scar form in that, in that leftover dead space. Now, when we do revisions down the road, the story will change, but for a primary hip, I prefer a capsulotomy. Um, I'll tag the anterior capsule. So you see we've made our kind of backwards L shape here. I'll tag it with a heavy non-absorbable suture. And then we're gonna put a retractor over the inferior and medial neck. So again, this is the left hip with the head to the right, the feet to the left. I've opened the capsule. I've got my first retractor inside the capsule now. Now I'm gonna tag this lateral capsule flap, and then I'm gonna release where that yellow line is, kind of making almost a T shape out of, this, out of this capsulotomy because I need to see the saddle of the femur. The saddle of the femur is where the neck comes down and then starts to curve back up to the greater trochanter. I need to see the saddle of the femur because that's the basis of my osteotomy of the femoral neck. So before that re second re that retractor goes 
inside the capsule. I need to tee this capsulotomy back, see the inside of the, um, of the saddle, and then get the second retractor in. Now I'm going to externally rotate the leg and I'm going to release the medial capsule. This is one of the most important releases you can perform. It is the most frequently under-released area except for the femur during this surgery. So the, the femur has to be externally rotated and the entire medial capsule has to be released until you can easily put a finger over the medial neck and feel the lesser trochanter. If you don't release this medial capsule completely, you'll have great difficulties removing the femoral head. You're gonna have difficulties with the exposure of the acetabulum, and then later on with the femoral exposure. Now, why? Um, because if that capsule's not released, the capsule's still very tight and it's hard to get the head out, okay? Number two, why is the acetabulum hard to expose? Because that capsule is anterior and medial hip capsule. So when we cut the neck, get the head out, we're sticking a retractor underneath the anterior hip capsule and over the acetabulum to get exposure of the acetabulum. If that capsule is not released, the femoral neck pulls up into the wound because capsule is still attached to it. If that capsule is complete, really, completely released, the femur falls posteriorly and it doesn't interfere in exposure of your acetabulum. So release the medial neck. If you're struggling and removing the femoral head, the number one reason is inadequate medial capsule release. Number two reason is a high neck cut. Those two things, um, probably 95% of difficulty removing the femoral head is because my medial capsule is not released or my neck cuts too high. Um, this is what you should see when the capsule is completely released. You can see that top retractor over the medial neck, and you can see that just empty black space where before you can see the arrow where that was, how that capsule is adherent. Now you just see an empty black space where the capsule has been completely released. That's how it should look. The finger should go over easily to be able to feel the lesser trochanter. We talked about the osteotomy of the femoral neck. I use the saddle as my guide. Um, you can also use the lesser trochanter because if you've done a proper medial release, you'll put your finger over the neck. You can feel the lesser trochanter and you can make your, you know, one finger breadth above the lesser, you know, cut or whatever you preoperatively template it need to be. Um, you can always bring in fluoroscopy as well. Uh, if you have that in the room, just double check yourself because it looks different than if you're coming from a posterior approach for sure. And so um, if you're uncomfortable, bring in fluoroscopy, double check off the lesser trochanter. The important thing about cutting the femoral neck, you can cut all the way through on the medial side and the middle of the neck. But when you get to that superior and lateral part of the femoral neck, do not cut all the way through the second cortex because the greater trochanter hooks around. And it's very easy to cut the tip of the greater trochanter off. So I'll cut through the, the medial calcar, the middle of the neck, and then I just crack and break that lateral side. Or some people use a little, you know, osteotome or something of that nature. Um, taking the femoral head out, corkscrew. Uh, I like putting the corkscrew into the cut side of the, um, of the uh, neck. Uh, some people do a napkin ring where they make a double osteotomy and take out a section. Um, or you can put the corkscrew in the articular side. But, you know, again, this is a dealer's choice thing. It's not really a critical part of the surgery because there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, on exposing the acetabulum, for me, I use two retractors, one anterior retractor, one posterior retractor. You'll see this inferior capsule fold that when those two retractors are in, 
there'll be a band of inferior capsule that stretches across the acetabulum. I take a bovi and simply make a, a cut in it, a, a longitudinal cut um, just to release that inferior capsule, but I do not excise it because as you, as you look farther down on that picture, that's gonna get into posterior capsule. I don't wanna cut my posterior capsule out. So I'll make a release in it, but I'm not gonna, uh, gonna remove any. When I'm preparing the acetabulum, I like using fluoroscopy. Um, I use fluoro to both ream the acetabulum. Uh, I use fluoro to insert the acetabular component. For me, it provides me a way to ideally position this reamer and component exactly where I want them to be. So when I'm getting ready to start before I do anything, and we'll go over this, um, you know, a little more, um, we're talking about understanding fluoroscopy, and even a little more in the following lecture doing a primary hip. But I think it's so important that uh, it needs to be brought up how to read this fluoroscopy shot. We want to make sure the pelvis is level to the floor because we talked about the anterior approach as being the patient supine, much easier to dictate the pelvis being level. Okay. But we want to make sure about that. You don't want to just trust somebody's on their back, the pelvis is straight level to the floor. So I'm bringing in the x ray over the center of the pelvis, and I'm going to look at the relationship of the pubic symphysis to the midline of the sacrum. I'm going to look at the shape of the obturator foramen, but most importantly, and I think the easiest determining sign that a pelvis is level is looking at the relationship of the ilioischial line to the teardrop. On this x-ray, you can see the ilioischial line is lateral to the teardrop symmetrically on both sides. So that's the easiest indicator for me. And what I'll do is bring in the C-arm and look at it. And if my pelvis isn't level, I'll tilt the table a little bit one way or the other, because I want to make sure my pelvis is completely flat before I start to prepare the socket and put the component in. Because if my pelvis isn't flat, then you run into similar problems that you do in a lateral position where you think you're putting your component in the exact correct position, but because of the tilt of the pelvis, it's not. So when I'm reaming the things that we look at, you know, how do you know, I, these are questions I get, how do you know the, where the medial wall is if you're not looking at it? Well, we have an x-ray and the teardrop is the medial wall of the acetabulum. You can see the teardrop and the lateral edge of the teardrop is the medial wall of your acetabulum. It's just the radiographic landmark for it. So you don't have to look at it to know where your reamer is in space. And how do you know your antiversion and your abduction? Because I get this question a lot as well. Well, to know your antiversion, you look at the ellipse of the reamer, just like you would on a post-operative x-ray. You know, you can look at an x-ray and know that a cup is in proper antiversion just by looking at the ellipse. The same thing on the fluoro shot and the, and the reamer. So I can look at this x-ray and I try to make it so the pubic symphysis is parallel with the side of the x-ray screen so that I can, again, assess my abduction my antiversion I assess by the ellipse, my medialization I assess by the teardrop, and then my hip center of rotation I assess by the bottom of the reamer or the bottom of the cup. Because the bottom of the teardrop is your anatomic landmark for the bottom of the native acetabulum. So ideally you want your reamers and your cup to be at the bottom of the teardrop. So it's very easy with fluoroscopy to be able to look at your antiversion, your abduction angle, my hip center of rotation, my medialization. And it's also easy to see when your cup is seated. You know, you're not having to check through a screw hole with a, a tool to see if it's all the way down. You're looking at an x-ray, you know it's all the way down. So I think there are tons of advantages for using 
uh, fluoroscopy. And, and even though I've done over 10,000 um, hip arthroplasty procedures from this approach, I still use it. And I don't look at it as it's a crutch or it's, um, you know, some tool that I absolutely have to depend on. I, I'm absolutely sure I could do a, an anterior approach without fluoroscopy. Um, but why not use it if you can easily to assure that your implant positions are going to be extremely consistent in the position you want them in. The femoral exposure is always the more difficult part, and this part's difficult to show with still pictures. Again, we'll, um, when the videos start, I hope that it's a much clearer picture about what we're doing. Um, but this is with the leg externally rotated now, and for me, the leg's an extension because I use, um, you know, a fracture table on a regular OR table. Um, the leg's going to be more an adduction than it really is extension. Um, so you'll be working in adduction. Now, the view is the same. Um, it doesn't change the releases and it doesn't change anything. It's just uh, the femur's adducted versus extended. So I try and look for the interval between that lateral hip capsule that I've already previously tagged. And that's another reason I think capsulotomy is better than capsulectomy, um, especially when you're first starting, because when you get to this position trying to release the femur, it can be very confusing about what's capsule, what's muscle, am I releasing something bad? Can I release this? Um, when you have the tag suture on it, it immediately identifies your hip capsule. So you can see the tag suture here, you know what the hip capsule is. And so I try to get the retractor in, the homan in, between the minimus and the capsule. In this particular x-ray, you see I've kind of perforated the minimus a little bit. So the minimus muscle is visible in front of that retractor, but I want to release the interval in between the hip capsule and the minimus. And that's gonna give me my orientation of my release all the way down to bone. So as I'm releasing down, and this shows the release completed, and it shows the dissection out of the obturator internus and the piriformis. So, the obturator internus or the conjoined tendon, because technically this tendon has the gemelli contributing to it by the time it gets to this point, that has to be cut, okay? Um, it, it really has to be cut to get the femur up and elevated. Um, that and releasing the tip of the trochanter are the two keys to releasing the femur. The piriformis, because it's so close to the top tip of the trochanter, it typically flips over the top of the trochanter once the obturator internus or the conjoint tendon has been cut. But the, con the capsule needs to be released from the minimus. The obturator internus needs to be cut. You can see in this picture, the P is on the piriformis that obturator internus or conjoint tendon that's present there is now gone and it allows for the femur to lateralize from the acetabulum and elevate and so the conjoint gets cut the tip of the trochanter gets released so they can buttonhole through some through that little capsule the little posterior superior capsule buttonholes through and then you can put a lot of elevation without worrying about breaking the tip of the trochanter off. Um, preparing the femur is the same as with any approach. I mean, there's really not anything exciting about it. Um, we start posterior, we lateralize. Um, the broach handles are going to be a little bit different, like we talked about. You're going to use an offset or a double offset broach handle. But there's no difference in the preparation of the femur except for you don't want to increase antiversion, okay? When you're broaching a posterior approach, you're trying to add a little bit of antiversion because you want to prevent posterior dislocation. With an anterior approach, we are following along the posterior neck, 
parallel to it, and we do not want to increase um, increase the antiversion. The reason we start posterior in the neck is to get in line with the diaphysis of the femur. If you start broaching in the middle of the neck and you're not paying attention to position of the knee and aiming for the knee, then you can perforate the femur posteriorly at the posterior cortex, which when the leg is externally rotated like this, the posterior cortex is where that two prong or Mueller, um, you know, retractor is. But again, basics of the approach, the steps here, when we get on into the, um, into the other lectures, we're going to get into some videos and a little more of the detail. But the key points to understand, um, you know, about this approach um, before you get started, we always want to be lateral to the ASIS. That's our lighthouse. You absolutely have to identify and control the lateral femoral circumflex vessels. The medial capsule has to be released fully so you can easily feel the lesser trochanter. Fluoroscopy is a great tool for reaming assistance, cup placement. We talked about aiding in the osteotomy of the femur. And also when you're broaching, if you're worried about the position of your brooch or you're worried you have a perforation, fluoroscopy is easy to bring in and double check. The conjoint tendon has to be released. And I should also put on there, the tip of the trochanter has to be released because you'll see in the upcoming segments how we cut the conjoin, then we continue the dissection up over the tip of the troch so it can buttonhole around the acetabulum and come up. And broaching always start posterior in the neck to avoid this anterior to posterior orientation and perforation. Um, and it also allows us to use the posterior neck um, as a guide for our antiversion. So I appreciate your intention, your attention. Uh, we ran right about an hour or so. Um, so I'm gonna stop here. Um, tune into the next uh, series, um, the next, next lecture in the series, where we're gonna talk about the surgery itself um, from simple things like positioning, draping, to the instruments, the retractors that we use, um, to a surgical video um, that really shows really nice live footage of uh, recorded footage um, of the surgery so you can understand it in a live time format. Um, so again, uh, appreciate your attention and I greatly appreciate um, the opportunity uh, to be part of uh, this lecture series. Thank you.